Welcome to My POA Podcast, Black Hand and Beyond. Tonight we're on episode 56. Uh, tonight's episode is about a picture, actually, that was taking, taken in 1965 of the board of directors of the POAC, which consists of seven gentlemen at the time. Uh, by 1975, only two of the people uh, remained on the board that was on the board in 65. And tonight we're just going to kind of briefly chronicle the lives of all seven men, uh, the impact of what they had on POAs. All of them had a pretty big impact, and of course, because of the way the board of directors is set up, and including today, they were from different parts of the country, so that makes it a unique story too, and uh, how history was kind of shaped, and what they had to kind of go through in 1965, considering the breed was just a little over 10 years old since it started in 1954. So let me get the screen going here and some pictures so here is that picture of the seven gentlemen which is keystone on the left and then from left to right is lynn puffenbarger then gd sales in the middle is bob moser and then john ludwig james bicknell the third and on the end is norm stevenson from texas norman stevenson so uh, that's the seven gentlemen there and uh, tonight I can follow along a little better because I do have my phone. We don't have any guests tonight, uh, which I kind of did on purpose. I asked if anybody wanted to uh, chime in or be a guest on the phone, especially because there could be some family members or people that are fairly close to these gentlemen. And uh, no one really took me up on it. A few said they would if nobody else did. And then I thought, you know what, I'll just do a history part of it and I'll just uh, uh, talk about these people and save guests for another episode. So if you ever want to be uh, on the show or if you want to be a topic of a show, please don't be shy. If you if you got something you want to talk about, we don't talk about politics. We keep it positive. But uh, like somebody brought up Supreme Champions, and we're going to have an episode on that uh, fairly soon about Supreme Champions. So if you have a topic that you want to bring up or just want to be a guest on one of the topics you see me advertising about on the Facebook group, please contact me. So it's really easy to do. You just answer your phone and talk like we're at a cafe somewhere having coffee, talking about uh, the breed of horse that we love. So uh, Jan's on here, Joan Schultz, uh, Renee, let's see who else is on here. Ricky, so we got quite a few people watching already and six others it says there, so uh, that's good. So of these seven gentlemen, of course, this picture was taken in 1965. I was born in 1972. I was uh, fortunate enough to become friends with three of these gentlemen. Of course, Lynn Puffenberger, Bob Moser, and Norm Stevenson. So uh, two of the gentlemen I never met, that would be D. Sales from Washington and James Bicknell. Uh, and then actually I never met John Ludwig, but we became pen pals. Now I'll tell that story when we get to it. He wrote me a letter when he found out I was writing a book that included Danny Boy, so he sent me a whole bunch of stuff. Of course, I responded. We never did talk on the phone or anything like that, but we did send some letters back and forth and some cards, so that was pretty cool. And then I did meet Keystone when I was a young kid. Um, they were kind of, when we got in it in 82, 83, they were starting to phase out a little bit, but I did see him at a few spring sales in Iowa and stuff, and I never had a conversation with him, but, you know, I got to know who he was that way, so unfortunately, I didn't get to, to uh, meet him too much beyond that, so. All right. My wife's here. Terry said hi. Terry's one of our good, uh, Viewers, he's having some great colts in Iowa again this year. Uh, he's one of the up-and-coming uh, young breeders. And we got quite a few other people watching, too. Shirley says hi. Uh, I can see you, Tracy. Hopefully I sound pretty good tonight. I got the volume turned down a little bit because we got a baby on the showroom uh, that's been really good so far, but it's about 15 feet from me, two feet from the door of the studio here at a salesperson's desk. Just my luck. So, but... Hopefully they get a car tonight and the baby is nice and quiet and we don't hear it uh, screaming. So uh, anyway, uh, that brings up the fact that we are in Enid, Oklahoma at Jackson's Auto Family Chrysler Dodge Jeep uh, Ram. We also sell 
uh, Chevy and GMC at the Kingfisher location, uh, the birthplace of Sam Walton, just 45 miles down the road, is a sister store. So, uh, of course, this is, wouldn't be possible without Jackson's. I also want to thank the Jackson family and the dealership for sponsoring uh, a bronze sponsor at the upcoming Congress. I asked Shane Jackson if uh, he would be willing to do that. I've never asked before. And uh, he said, of course. He goes, oh, man, it's your passion. He goes, it's your passion. Of course we'll do it. You didn't even have to ask. So I'm glad I did. And so you'll see a banner with Jackson's Auto Family hanging in Tulsa. Uh, and they'll be sponsoring a couple classes through that. So that's cool. So, all right, let's get to uh, the show tonight, which really doesn't have a title. I called it A Picture's Worth a 1,000 POAs, but I didn't want to confuse people about that. And it's just saying, you know, all these gentlemen own POAs. Of course, they were all a big part of helping shape this club and making rules, especially back in 65. Uh, but another funny thing about this, you know, they all bred POA. Some of them were bigger breeders, of course, than others. Uh, but all seven of these gentlemen ended up breeding for at least one national champion. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Sales was, just has one and Bicknell has one. Of course, Lynn Puffenberger was number one on the list for many years until now he's currently third. He was passed by the Steels and uh, uh, Carr, Gene Carr, so he's third currently. But then, of course, Bob Moser and John Ludwig are on the list pretty good, and so is GR's Keystone. So they're all represented at least by one win. I thought that was a really cool fact. Another thing that I couldn't believe it when I decided to do this episode was that um, in my book, Spots Included, and this is just a coincidence. It just is how things are put together. But my book, Spots Included, uh, the first eight chapters in that book of course if you're not, not familiar with it it's about stallions that shaped the poa breed and these gentlemen owned a part of or at least all of the first eight stallions that were in the book so and we'll talk about that as we go through some were later in life and stuff like that some had you know was very shaped around the person like ladies warrior and bob moser of course and chief little britches and and Lynn Puffenbarger, it's hard to separate the two. Uh, think of one without the other when you're talking about POA history. So, um, all right. So Tracy said thank you, uh, Jacksons. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. So we're going to go to the screen here. And we're going to keep this picture on here. And I'm just going to go through a little bit of each person first before I go on to each one. Uh, kind of their brief bio, but in this picture again Keystone's on the left. He's from Iowa. He was the Goldenrod Pony Farm uh, Him and his uh, brother-in-law uh, Ray Morris, of course run that in Sheraton, Sheraton, Iowa The Stone family and the Morris family had a long history in POAs and uh, He's 43 years old in that picture uh, Keystone, so he was born in 1922 and passed away in 1990 Four, he ended up being the youngest to pass away of this group of gentlemen. Uh, but in this picture, he's kind of in the middle for age at 43. Then, of course, we have Lynn Puffenbarger's next. He uh, was only uh, 34 years old in this picture. So when I got on the board of directors, I broke Lynn's record for the youngest director. Now that's since been broke by many people. I think I was 28 or 29 when I got on the board. And Lynn was... Uh, probably 33 or 34. Uh, so he was, of course, born in 1931, passed away in 2018. And then G.D. Sales from Washington, he was the longest living of this group. He lived to be 91 years old, and he was 41 in this picture. Bob Moser was 45 in this picture. He's the gentleman in the middle. Farmer from Illinois, down by Decatur, uh, Illinois, not indicator, but near there, he helped get a lot of people involved, which all these gentlemen did, uh, helped get a lot of people involved in POAs. Uh, John Ludwig also lived to be uh, 89. He's just to the right of Bob Moser there. Of course, he was from Pennsylvania and then later moved to Georgia where he passed away in Georgia. Uh, he was born in uh, 1916, so he'd be the earliest born of this group, so he was the oldest in this picture 49 in this picture he passed away in 05 james bicknell the third from michigan is second to last there on the right uh, he also lived to be 89 years old he was 40 
uh, or he lived to be, I'm sorry, 78 years old, and he was 37 in this picture. He was the third youngest in this picture, 1928 to 2007. And then uh, Norm Stevenson there, I joke, he looks like uh, Kent Clark, uh, Western version of Kent Clark. Uh, I really like Norm Stevenson. If you ever got to know him, he was quite a guy. He was in POAs for a long time, but for decades, not many people knew it. He just kind of kept to himself down in Texas. And then later in his life, thanks to some people we'll talk about, he kind of came back and brought some of his POAs back that he'd been breeding for decades down there on his ranch in Texas. So, he, of course, him and Lynn were close to the same age. He was born just a year earlier, so he was 35 in this picture, lived to be 88. He passed away in 2018 when we lost so many uh, great POAs around that time, 2018, 2019, in that area. So um, we're going to scroll now through some pictures. I tried to put a bunch of pictures on here, so and thank you for all the comments, and especially the clicks and the likes. I don't get judged or paid off of facebook for that but boy we sure had a lot of likes every time i checked my bell the last day or two uh, i've ha had 20 or 25 notifications saying somebody liked or commented on something so that was cool and that makes uh, the day go by and fun so okay here is keystone right here again grs uh, he bred some early POAs. Uh, Keith made some trips to Mexico and brought up some POAs like that. He wasn't associated with Dragon, but he went and brought, brought batches back like that. And he found a lot of POAs in a lot of places, registered them. GR's Raindrop is one of them that he found. Uh, there's probably a picture of her here. She was actually bred to be a POA, but he found her in Arkansas in a sales barn. And uh, let's see, she's probably one of these here there she is there's i think that's carl stone in gr's raindrop her claim to fame was she was the first supreme champion mare in the poa breed so uh keystone always loved the siri chief bloodlines and eventually he ended up buying siri chief but there was a lot of gr series uh way before he purchased siri chief from paula cooper and here they're advertising two of the last G a Siri Chief foals there ever was. So that's a pretty rare photo here. It was from the magazine, of course, but you see on the top from last full crop of Siri Chief number two. So there's a colt and a, and a mare. I think I've heard of GR's Dolly Bar. If anybody heard of any of these, I never heard of the colt on the left, Bo uh, Evo or whatever, however you pronounce that, but I never heard of him except for this picture, but I had heard of her. So and then let's see there's gr series spotlight i just included her because she was really nice philly there was so many grs they registered a whole bunch of grs and some they raised some they were the you know he found but a lot of them he bred so carl laus told me one time growing up in minnesota of course i knew him really well he told me this would have been in the 90s he said to him one of the most important people in poa history was keystone because when he was president of the board in the 70s, he said he just really held things together. And he said if he had to pay for something out of his own pocket, then get reimbursed or whatever to make sure things happen, he would. So he just said he was that kind of guy. And uh, like I say, he was a director. He hadn't been president yet when this picture was taken. Uh, here's his president's message when he's leaving as the president. He'd been president for about three years when he wrote this in 1973. Of course, he stayed on the board after this, but he did his uh, term as, as uh, president. I kind of like this down here. If you see that, that's decades before the Orrin Mixer painting, and that's kind of looks a lot like it down there. But anyway, if you have a chance to read this in its entirety on Facebook, it's on there right now. You can go and click on it and read it. Uh, so it's a pretty cool deal. And there he is, there's the club thanking him for 1970 to 73 for his outstanding leadership to the club. And there's GR Siri Rebel, that's one of the POAs. I know the Corns owned him for a while as a gilding. He was in a lot of POA, uh, with a lot of POA families. So, um, so that's Keystone. Like I say, we're just gonna do a brief, we could do, and uh, episode two, 
is about Siri Chief, and his program's mentioned a lot there. So if you want to go back and watch episode two of uh, Black Hand and Beyond, you'll find more out about uh, Goldenrod POAs. Okay, so the next gentleman pictured would be Lynn Puffenbarger, and there's Lynn. There's his picture. So, of course, there's a write-up. I the family asked me to do a write-up in uh, about 11 or 12, and I did it for the magazine. Lynn didn't know anything about it, but 50 years celebrating 50 years. And uh, here's his president's message. Now he was on the board for a long time, from the 60s to the 80s. He was the president for one year in the mid-70s in between Keystone and Olin Ziegler from Ohio. And then again, he got back. Olin ran or was president for quite a while, a few years. And then in 1980, Lynn became president again. And he was president for about the first half of the 80s. As Jackie Guthrie mentioned uh, earlier on Facebook on one of these posts, she was his vice for a couple terms. So here's... A cool president's message. Most of these presidents had a message every month in the magazine, almost every month. And you know, if you knew anything about the Salty program, he spread the Salties around by selling them at sales so much. And he mentions here, I feel very fortunate to have been able to attend four of the spring sales that were held in Ohio, Minnesota, Illinois, and Kansas. And I guarantee you, he probably consigned POAs to every one. And he might have brought some of them home, but he was there. And then it mentions later on, if you read this, uh, that, you know, he got to visit with people from all over those states and those regions. And it just helped, uh, you know, him keep on top of what was going on as the president. So, and here is the article that's in the magazine. You can check this out. I believe it was in 2012, 2011, somewhere in there when this article was Written. It's a pretty good short little article, kind of a synopsis of his career. Of course, Chief Little Britches was the stallion he purchased from his for his family, leased him first from the uh, Bridges family, and then uh, then they ended up buying him, and that changed history. Uh, you know, him and Cherokee over there, Chief Little Britches had a lot of, of babies, and this sale featured him and Salty Three Bars, the stallion he got from. Uh, George Bishop and made a grand champion of him. He was a full brother to Barkeeper, but he had a production sale in 1976 in Hutchison, Kansas. So that's pretty cool. You don't see a lot of uh, POA breeders having their own production sale. It's happened, but not that often. Here's Lynn and his son Tommy with two fillies that both became grand champion mares back to back, 1999 and 2000. These are both Spanish array daughters, world champion uh, Wees Camp. Branded stay in Spanish Array. He was in the area over by Lynn's, uh, just about 30, 40 miles from where we are right now. So Lynn hauled mares to him, and these two were the result. Uh, every colored POA that lived that Lynn got by Spanish Array became an international champion or national congress champion. Uh, so that's quite a feat for that, considering he was a champion uh, quarter horse, halter horse. Here's just some early pictures of Lynn. He was in it a long time, 50 plus years. As Jackie mentioned, she's now 50 years involved in POAs. Uh, it's a long time. You got to get involved fairly young like Jackie did and like Lynn did. There he is with salty odd look, a colt I had uh, in condition for him. My dad hauled him down. He won the Tulsa Red Earth, the Tulsa Futurity in this picture with him. Here's Lynn and Chief Little Britches early on waiting for results or waiting to go in the class. Got the Perina back number on. This is a classic photo. I have um, a museum folder in my phone or it says studio. It's for pictures I was going to print out and put in this very studio I'm sitting in. And this is one of them. It's got the iconic decal of Chief Little Britches and says Pony of America, and then that's Winona and Lynn. Very good picture of those two. There's Lynn with just a random salty. Again, at the Tulsa, Lynn loved the Tulsa Stair and Fair and promoted it, was involved with it more than just POAs. 
Uh, also, Alfalfa County, he did a lot for Alfalfa County as soon as, as long as uh, so has his son, Tommy. Tommy's still very involved. He works with the inst extension office over there. This is Salty Miss Leo. She became a famous mare. She ended up at the Pony Farm. Uh, Butch Hammer had her. This is when she still had spots all over. Uh, she became a grand champion in 1983. A young filly there. Here's a sign Tommy sent me the picture of. Pretty cool sign. Piney Bar sired some POAs. Double zero. I'm not sure he didn't sire too many. He didn't get famous for doing it. But Piney Bar, to me, is a household name because I've seen his name for years on the leading sires list. But, of course, Chief Little Britches uh, got it all going for Lynn. He did have some stallions before that, like Salty uh, Plains and stuff like that. But Chief Little Britches is the one that really put it, put it on the map so and here's a picture of lynn now this is kind of a political picture we are talking about the board of directors tonight so this is about the most political show i'll get but uh he did this on purpose because uh the rules at the time was so open that he said you know you could take a spotted meal in if it measured because of the hardship laws and the hardship rules and stuff so you know lynn was always trying to make a point and if you knew lynn he always knew his rule book as good as anybody so here's a picture taken out of his house his hall of fame plaque and uh, he was the first diamond premier breeder by the way lynn puffenbarger was there's kind of a controversy lynn and bob moser who we're going to talk about later kind of went back and forth who was the first premier sire chief little britches or uh ladies warrior they both advertised that the, they were the first uh, i may find that out someday and, and report on it but not that it really matters now but so and then again lynn played a big part as being president and keeping the keeping the club afloat and he was on the board for a long time he saw a lot of change in poas you know just think when he started in poas it was 52 he just started then and then he's seen it go to 54 and of course the 56 that's about the time he was uh, done on the board of directors so all right so our next gentleman is gd sales i don't know a lot about mr sales i do know what put him on the map in poas and it's this picture right here so he was a businessman from washington i believe he owned a pest control company and uh, another cool thing is i looked up the obituaries of all these gentlemen and he died at 91 years old hadn't been in poa since when we got it in, in 83 or 82 sales weren't in poas yet or then they'd already been gone so uh the fact that in his obituary in 2015 it mentions poas it says he had a champion herd of poa uh i don't know if it said horses or ponies and that he served on the board of directors so i thought that was cool and all seven of these gentlemen of at least six of them their obituaries mentioned Pony of the Americas, and most of them have mentioned that they served on the board. The only one I couldn't find, and there might be another obituary out there, is John Ludwig. But you got to remember, you know, his wife had passed away. He'd moved from Pennsylvania where all the kids that uh, he got started in POA and stuff were. So it, it just was another time in his life. If it would have been written by a certain person, for sure POA would have been mentioned in his write-up as well. So... We have a lot of people uh, commenting and watching. That's good. Okay, so again, G D Sales from Washington. Uh, a few people watching probably know uh, what made them a, a big name in POAs. They're the people that purchased Black Hand. When Black Hand was sold at the Boomhauer Barrett uh, sale, and Les Boomhauer knew he didn't have enough time to promote the horse and he wanted him he was hoping he'd go somewhere far from iowa and his wish was true he sold for a lot of money made a lot of publicity out of it you know as far as for the poa the poa club i won't say was fledgling but it was uh, pretty young still when they sold black hand in february of 63 he wasn't even uh, 10 years old yet and of course it started december 10th of 1954 is when the Pony of America started. So that's him right there, black hand on the the 
left. That's not a picture you normally see because it wasn't taken in Iowa. That picture was taken in Butte, Colorado at the Corette Ranch. Um, over on the right is Corette Scottish Chieftain and Sales also purchased him. And that's the two things that really put Sales on the map. They got into the business in a big way. Uh, I believe they spent what was it, 7,700 or whatever it was, just under 8,000 at auction for uh, Black Hand, and it's reported they gave uh, Corette about four grand for the aging uh, Scottish Chieftain. He was up in his teens by then. Nobody knows the exact age he was anyway, uh, but you know he was already an older stallion. So in today's dollars, that's a small fortune. In 1963, that would have been close to $12,000 plus. There's some cool stories if you ever want to see them. I can share them on face, the POA Facebook history group about their trip from Iowa back to Washington. And they stayed two days in Colorado, and they just they hit a blizzard in South Dakota, and it was just a terrible trip home with Black Hand. But both stallions made it and uh, lived out their life in, in Washington. So the horse in the middle is a grandson of both. He's by uh, Bear Paw. That's Hans Paw. So... He's by Bear Pie, I believe, and out of a black hand daughter is how that goes. So something like that. I'm starting to slip a little bit in my history, but let's see. Let me scroll down to the pictures I have because I do have a few more pictures. There they are for sales. So there we see the sales ranch in Colfax, Washington. They moved later. Uh, black hand died in 19... 68 that's his memorial there uh, june of 68 it's on the cover of the magazine he's buried under a tree in there the last place they had where they were when they had him so that's hands uh disel do up in the top there with the black spots all over him just kind of a version of black hand just a little more then there's an early snow cap in the poa breed he's actually a black hand son i think tracy will get a kick out of that and then there's that classic picture again that's a picture for the museum of course for sure and a history picture there taken in 1963 in Colorado that's Jack Rivers right here he was uh, holding Corrett Scottish Chieftain he was the ranch manager for Bob Corrett and we're going to talk about Bob Corrett here a little more too in a minute when we get to uh, some of these guys when they were so here's the cover story and inspiration. This talks about when they got Black Hand a little bit and how he'll continue to inspire them. And they crossed the blood really well of Black Hand and Court Scottish Chieftain. Uh, he also helped form the Washington Club, I believe. He was a big part of the Washington Club early, early on, sales was. And this is a pretty good looking early POA right here. This is Scotty's Yucatan, 76-64, early number. So full brother to Corette's Broken Arrow, who was a snow cap, uh, really early Corette stallion. There's the Black Hand Memorial. There's Scottish Hands Disaldu. Hand Snow Chief, 56-66 is this one here. He was a Washington bred Black Hand. There wasn't a lot of black hands out in Washington. Most of them were from Iowa, but sales did. People bred to black hand. And that picture that was taken in this picture right here, a lot of people traveled to see black hand when they found out he was there for a couple days. They said that people came over to look at him because he was pretty famous, you know, the beginning of a whole new breed in America. He was the reason for it. So, And there's a write-up again, so... Again, I don't know a lot about, I wish I knew more about D sales. I probably know as much as anybody uh, alive in POAs. His family would know a lot more. If anybody knows how to contact any of them or know any information, uh, let me know, and I'll be glad to share it. So, so now we move on to kind of a bigger-than-life character. Some of these gentlemen were, and that's Bob Moser. And I haven't done a 7Ms episode yet, and I need to. I need to badly. Uh, I ended up befriending Bob. He, uh, I nominated 7M's Warriors Bonnet to the Hall of Fame. I couldn't believe she wasn't in the Hall of Fame. She got in first time I nominated her. And uh, 
ever after that i mean i walked on water to bob he just thought i was great and he'd like he liked me rattling off wins and people horses that won stuff and pedigrees and he really enjoyed that so he was in his 80s when we became a real good friends i spent the night at their house one time when i gave a speech at the decatur club uh, for the illinois poa club and uh, that was cool cool time and i uh, got to really get to know uh, bob and gene of course seven m's is because they had the five kids and then uh the two parents, so they named their POA 7Ms. And this is what really got them going in POAs was he found a gray mare that had a pedigree. She just wasn't registered. They brought her home, named her Lady of Paint. And, of course, she was in full, and she's, so she's the mother to Ladies Warrior, who became one of the early famous, famous sires. To me, Chief Little Britches and Ladies Warrior is what pushed the breed to a stock pony from just being a pony to a using ranch type pony that kids could ride, even tall kids could ride a 54 inch pony. It was this mare's son right here, Ladies Warrior and Chief Little Britches who really did that. And in the 70s, they were still going strong, their foals. He ended up dying fairly young. I think he was 16 or so, but they'd slowed down. They'd lost some of their property uh, their horse park property to an interstate loop, uh, Moser's did, and they were farmers out there, so uh, they they just didn't, you know, they weren't pushing as much in the 80s, but Bob did come back with his grandkids, uh, Bobby's kids, Bobby and Kay's kids, and Leslie and Travis, and Leslie showed all over the country with her grandpa. They traveled around. He bought a new truck and trailer, and they I remember seeing them in South Dakota, and uh, so that was years after they were very big in the 60s. They pushed hard in the 60s from about 63 on to 68 or so. And then even in the 70s, they were shown. But it was really in the late 60s when they promoted a lot of ladies' warriors get. And a lot of them were loud colored, and they, were, they had stamina, and they'd just go and go. The warriors you see now, back in the old magazines, they came from him. Warriors this and that, warriors shamrock stuff like that. Doc Demers bred to him several times. Uh, Steels went and bred to him when they were in Illinois, based in the Air Force. And uh, there's a cool, it's the same picture. They use the same picture of him a lot, but he kind of had that cluster of spots there that they busted up in the photos. But if you knew the horse in person, that was more of a cluster. And uh, for being a leopard though, he did have a lot of a leopard foals, but of course a lot of that's who he was bred to. But uh, Bob Moser was 6'6". He was a high school standout basketball player, and he was, you know, you see his feet are hanging there a little bit, but uh, those pictures are taken in 67. And, uh, but they were quite a team, ladies were. And here's some of his foals I'm talking about. Uh, of course, the one way down on the bottom left here, uh, we've talked about her on this show, 7M's Warriors Bonnet. She became a two-time grand champion mare. She was also a stakes winner. Uh, she became like a family pet to the Nemers family. Several families owned her, but the Nemers had her last. They raised some foals by her and Doc's Tough Dude. One became Doc's Dandy Dude, supreme champion by the time he was like four, something like that. Uh, Alan Hansen in Wisconsin, Supreme de Merle, and then they retired him. But you see 7M's Warriors Flaming Ember, loud colored, uh, bar none was really loud colored. KG Lady, I think, was black or really dark. And uh, Seminole Warrior, a lot of those warriors were so loud colored. Bar Bob, I think, went to the west and created a family out there in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, again, we will have an episode on, on 7Ms and the Mosers family later on. So we, I should have had one already, but uh, it's kind of tough when these guys are gone. I wish we could have did stuff like this when some of these guys were still here. I said it for years, and unfortunately it came true, but I said we need to. Yeah, Oregon, that's right. He David Wood, he was in Oregon. And uh, we need to honor these people while they're still alive. And uh, I wanted to have, like, coffee table chats, I called it. I even wrote a letter to the board of directors in the early uh, teens, 2000, I don't know what it was, 10 or 12 or something like that, and said, you know, we need to start preserving some of these memories and have conversations. And 
Hopefully these podcasts are doing that, but I sure wish I could be sitting across or talking on the phone to a lot of these people we've lost so many of. So that's what the show is for, too, is to honor these people. Because all these people, just like the 12 directors we have right now, if you agree with them, don't agree with them, best friends with them, family members, your kids show against them, whatever, they're devoting their time and their money and their energy to something they wouldn't have to. Uh, I'm talking about the current board right now and all the boards we've had for since they created a board. So all these people donate their time and effort to do one thing. And they may have different ideas than you or they may agree, disagree, but they're all trying to preserve and uh, keep this thing going and to make it better. And these guys, not that they were that much more special, but back in 65, it was a whole different deal. I mean, it was still shaky that this Pony of America thing would even uh, keep going. So and we'll get to that when James McNeil, when we get to his story, because he was president and uh, in his Hall of Fame write-up, they talk a lot about some of the things he helped accomplish. Here's some cool pictures the ladies warriors get. A couple different years there. He was a champion sire. Like I say, he first became famous as a baby sire, and then his POAs went on to do everything. Talk about all-around POAs. They just would let kids jerk and pull on them and do whatever they wanted to. And, uh, of course, they had some good kids riding them, too. Uh, here's Bonnet. A tribute to Bonnet, Supreme Champion. Shaw's had her, the Carpenters had her, Nemers. I might be missing a family that had her. Uh, I think Karen in Pennsylvania might even have rode her. So a lot of people rode her, and uh, they all remember it, too. A legend in his own time. Here's a little cover story about Ladies Warrior. He was on the cover many times. Ladies Warrior was. They were good promoters, Mosers, when they were showing and going down the road. So, so that's a little brief highlight of Bob Moser. And now the next gentleman in the picture is John Ludwig. Tonight's show's not going to be real long. I figured I could do this in about an hour or so. Um, John Ludwig, of course. Stuart's Danny Boy and John Ludwig, you can't say, you can't write a sentence without both names in it in POA history. And uh, he found Stuart's Danny Boy up in Canada. As the story goes, he went up there to find a stallion. He'd been working with a gentleman named Mr. Stuart. I'll pay somebody money if they can tell me who his first name, what his first name was. Everything I've seen throughout history since I was a kid, they just call the gentleman in Canada Mr. Stuart. But when the Ludwigs, John and Grace, traveled from uh, Pennsylvania to Canada to look for, look at the stallion that uh, Mr. Stewart had found from him, for him, uh, they didn't like him. They, his name was Circus. He became Circus King. He was a leopard. And it just wasn't what John was looking for. He'd seen stuff like that. I think probably the series and stuff. And he wanted to go a different direction. Well, the cool story goes that John heard a knicker and they walk over to another stall, and this guy standing there, of course he's older in this picture, but this would become the very famous immortal Stuart Stanny boy, and John put the name Stuart's on him because that's the guy that found him, and the story is he brought it, he imported him from uh, England, and that's his pedigree, his English type ponies, and that he was in Canada, and then John brought him to the United States, named him, uh, Stewart's Danny boy because of his ancestry so and we'll see a there's a good picture of John there I want to get to a group there we go group pictures so and I'll show you a young picture of Stewart's Danny boy he actually had a registered name uh, and we've talked about it his episode was I believe episode six of Yep, episode six is about Danny Boy. So if you want to watch that episode, if you haven't, it's a very good episode. Um, so there he is as a young, young POA stallion. And that's the same horse we just seen with Crystal riding him. There he is. They brought him back out to make him a Supreme Champion because he'd already retired when the Supreme Champion Award was developed. So John said, well, heck, I got a stallion in the barn that can do anything. They said he could do the poles like ABCs. And, uh, of course, he was one of the famous racehorses, race ponies. Uh, we have 
We had racing in POAs, if you weren't aware of that. It was big in the 60s. They'd have race meets with the national show. And then just, you know, it was still kids showing, so insurance and safety reasons and stuff. And just you had to get to places that you could run them. And it just got so tough that they ended up doing away with it. We will be talking about racing again later in this episode when we get to Norman Stevenson. Blurry pictures, but there he is, boy. It's like I planned this, huh? There, uh, there he is racing. A lot of kids rode Danny Boy. Uh, John Ludwig uh, got more kids involved in POAs than a lot of people did. Uh, we had that episode out in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, or Why I'm Missing right there. Uh, if you watch that one, it was live where my wife and I, when we went out to visit my mother-in-law, and we had a lot of people show up, about eight or nine people showed up that had had... Uh, ridden at John's Lazy A uh, place in Pennsylvania, and that was a cool time. We got to talk about and give a tribute to Danny Boy and John. There's Crystal doing the polls. She looks like, looks like she's just sitting in a recliner there, doesn't she? He's just he's got his head down and he's taking on those polls. So, of course, here he is with Debbie. That was a famous picture. Dave Spencer mentioned it's right over here. Uh, the comments are right on the side. Thanks for uh, chiming in, Dave. Uh, of course, he knows a lot of history. He grew up in POAs, and uh, so he knows these people personally. And that's a cool picture of Danny Boy. Somebody mentioned, too, he always, oh, right there, Carolyn Murfeld uh, said he looked so majestic, and he really did, especially as older he got, the older he got. So here's another famous person, and he, uh, he's not in the picture, but in the middle there, he's not in the main picture we're talking about tonight, but uh, Ed Murfeld, of course, was the ninth member of POAs. His connection to John Ludwig is they purchased this colt here, Tomahawk's Big Creek, and they made him famous. And then, uh, of course, they raised MPs, Big Creek's Jim Dandy from him, and then they sold him to Slagles and, uh, and Ludke's from Iowa. And they went on to do good things with Tom Ox, Big Creek. But this is the one of many champions that John raised by Danny Boy. So he has quite a few wins as a breeder. Let's see, about 27 wins John does. you got to remember he quit breeding before the class schedule really blew up. So that kind of hurt some guys like Mosers. You know, Mosers have 19 wins. But the show wasn't a week and two weekends long back then, the Congress. And he didn't have all these classes you have now which is, of course, going to equal more wins for the modern breeders. So here's a very good cover picture, Stewart's Danny Boy. This is a really blurry picture, but if you get to see it uh, in a magazine sometime, it's been in newspapers, it's just a good picture of John adjusting the bridle on Dan. He called him Dan. That was his beloved stallion. And Allison, of course, mentioned John and Prue. She loved this picture at the banquet. I want to know who that guy is over there, the announcer. He looks like he's got it on and got it going on with his 70s style collar and his uh, cool mustache there. So if anybody knows what show dad or breeder that was, he might have been just an MC from the holiday end, but I'm betting he had, just like it is today, he was probably a POA dad or had some connection. Here's another Tomahawks. A lot of them look similar. And then, of course, he had this made in honor of Danny Boy when he passed away. The Little Pony with the Big Heart, 1955 to 1978. So John was a businessman and did all kinds of things to make a living. Uh, just by reading his letters, he seemed like a cool dude. I think he probably was a no-nonsense type guy. And uh, that's how he approached POAs and racing. He didn't know anything about racing or pony racing when he got involved, but he ended up doing really well with Danny Boy, and he learned fast when he jumped in things. So, And he was a promoter, too. Here's He, he had a card, just like when a person passes away, he had a memorial for Danny Boy. And I have this. I have a couple copies of this, actually. And uh, when you flip it open, it's got pictures and poems and stuff, and just like it would for a person. So kind of cool. But that tells you how much this little pony meant to John Ludwig. 
So moving on to the rest of the picture, we have two people left to talk about. So James Bicknell, he's another gentleman. Him and, and uh, D Sales, they're the two I know the least about uh, throughout history, and they're two of the more forgotten men in this picture. But James Bicknell did a lot for the Michigan Club and, of course, a lot for the POA Club in general. And let me get to his pictures here. And Misha POAs, he had that until almost the 90s, but he wasn't coming around much with his POAs by then. But he was big in POAs in the 60s. He was with the group that purchased Dragon and brought Dragon to Michigan. So let me find his little... There it is. I only have two pictures there. So there's Dragon, and he's at the lead, actually. And then there's a couple other guys, Dr. Armstrong, and I think... Uh, guy named Rocky Hudson, maybe. I might have that wrong, but it was three gentlemen from Michigan that purchased Dragon from the Hunts, which was big news. He was in the sale in Iowa, and uh, he died not long after he went, went to Michigan. Of course, again, the age was hard to determine for sure, uh, just like a lot of facts about Dragon, exactly how old he was. But, you know, he had those books written about him and stuff, and he just became... Uh, bigger than life really and he really helped promote POAs regardless how he looked or what he did as a sire uh, just his legend helped uh, his story helped get a lot of kids interested in POAs got to check my comments here I see people commenting I love that so Tracy that statue was stolen I wasn't going to bring it up but somebody stole that statue I'm not sure if he ever replaced it but yeah he did tell me that that someone took that when he was still living in Pennsylvania so and then again like I say he moved on to Georgia uh, Grace his wife uh, battled cancer and I didn't put it in here because it's not POAs but she actually was in a cancer institute with an artist was a pretty well-known artist who was doing pictures for Coca-Cola at the time with the John Deere's and Coke signs and stuff like that. And they have one with Grace leaning against the fence and there's a pony baby and mare in the background. Unfortunately, it's after Ludwig's got out of POAs and it was their half Arabian ponies that they raised after Danny Boy passed away and down in Georgia. So it wasn't, I wish it would have been a spotted POA full, I'd be having it on all the time, but I do have a copy of that, thanks to John. I have a copy from a magazine, a full cover, color advertisement of that. So, but anyway, we're moving on to James Bicknell, uh, the third, and he was president of the board. So, just like a few years ago in 2018, when we lost so many people, you know, Gene Carr, Norm Stevenson, uh, of course, Lynn and Ken Steele. And there was others, and some of them were very involved as breeders still, and they still had kind of, you know, their hands on POA still, even though they weren't on the board of directors. And when they passed away, that kind of left a void and a lot of history there. You could always ask those gentlemen questions, and they were all very knowledgeable and all served on the board. Well, the same thing happened early on in POAs. Um, you know, after Les Boomhauer started POAs and he ran it himself for a long time, at first out of his law office in Mason City, and then they got an office of their own. Well, one of the early presidents was Fowler B. Poling of Kansas. He was a psychiatrist, I believe, from Wichita. Pow Wow Pony Farm was his uh, POAs he raised. And they kept going for a couple years, his family did after his death. But unfortunately, it was a tragic accident on his return home to Kansas from the Boomhauer Barrett sale, dispersal sale in uh, 63, he was killed in a car accident. And he was the sitting president of the POAC board of directors at the time. Well, he was very forward thinking, again, you know, very educated man, a psychiatrist. Uh, He'd had some good POAs. He was already adding some Appaloosas to his program because his POAs were kind of very short. Apache Chief was number four registered, and then his son Apache Brave was the 13th registered, and he was a grand champion stallion. But today they would be little bitty POAs, real ponyish color, a little you know suspect too on some of them. So he was starting to add quarter horse and app breeding early on in the 60s, and when. When he died, it was a big blow, and 
One of his good friends through POAs was Bob Corrett, and Bob picked up the reins and became the president of the club. He was almost retirement age. He had the ranch in uh, Colorado, and uh, he was a lawyer in Colorado, an attorney, and he kind of dropped everything and ran the POAs for a year till they could find somebody else to take the spot, and he actually was honored by the, Oklahoma, the Cowboy Museum in the state of Oklahoma here for his work. He became a charter member, lifetime member, for his work with the POA braid, which was ironic. He didn't get in the POA Hall of Fame for years and years later after it started, but uh, the Cowboy uh, Heritage Museum honored Bob Corrett in 1964 or five or so for his work with the POAC. And a lot of it was because of what he did after his good friend, uh, Mr. Poling, had passed away so suddenly. Well, after Bob did his year as president, this gentleman picked up the reins and was president for about, I believe, three years. And this is, again, James S. Bicknell III from Michigan. Uh, Misha POAs was his ponies. He raised some POAs that got out there, but mainly he did stuff for the club, like he really helped Michigan get on their feet and paved the way for later people like uh, Marilyn Graff and the Chestnuts and still people that are around today uh, to do what they've been able to do in POAs. So I do have some interesting stuff about Mr. Bicknell here I want to share. When they put him in the Hall of Fame, they actually did a pretty good write-up about some of the things he accomplished. And again, in his obituary, even though he hadn't been in POAs active for 30, 40 years at least, uh, they mentioned uh, that he was the president of the POA club. And that's all they mentioned. They don't mention that he raised POAs or anything like that. But in his Hall of Fame, it says why he was president, his Hall of Fame write-up now, uh, establishment of an identification registry. Well, that would be what we know today as the ID program. It's the first stud book that came out with its yellow. I got, I have like three copies of it now. And it's just the first ID POAs, uh, the solid POAs that were registered. And he helped do that. Uh, assisted in the formation of nine state POA clubs. So in his tenure as being president of the POA club, nine state clubs were formed. That tells you how early on that was. He helped establish the Proven Producer Award, which we still have today. Uh, and this is the major one that I know they probably, he might mention that in here too, uh, but became a recognized breed in the American Horse Shows Association. That was in the 60s, and James McNeil was a big uh, part of that. So then, of course, it just goes on to say, you know, uh, bylaws and stuff. He was an attorney also, uh, James McNeil was, so that helped. You know, the POAs was formed by an attorney, and then several of the first presidents were attorneys. Um, and then talks about the big trail ride he helped put on in Michigan, and it went through the peninsula, the upper peninsula there, and uh, Misha POA, so that's M-I-C-H-I, -I, part of Michigan, and then POA, that was one, that was his prefix, Misha POA Farm. Uh, they sold it in 1990. And they retired, I believe he retired to Florida. I think that's where, when he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, they announced him from Florida. So uh, James is mo known more now in history as being a director and a promoter more than his breeding. But again, he is on forever on the leading breeders list uh, with one win. So he does have, he did have one POA win at least one class. So, all right. So that's. James Bicknell III. I'm sure he still has some family around if anybody has any contacts. I asked about this earlier, but people forget sometimes and stuff. And After they see what you're doing and then they realize and they go, okay, I, I do know somebody, one of his grandkids or something. So the last gentleman in the picture to the far right over there was strapping Norm Stevenson. Again, he was young in that picture. I believe he was only 35, uh, depending on his birthday. He was born in 1930, so uh, he stayed in POAs the whole time. Uh, his career changed a little bit over the years, so sometimes he was more involved. Of course, his kids showed POAs. Uh, Karen is still around. That She rode POAs. All her kids uh, sat on at least or rode uh, 
Kootenai's Wee Willie around the yard. So that's one of the horses Norm had was Kootenai's Wee Willie. And it's because Kootenai's Wee Willie was a race pony and Norm really liked the racing aspect of POAs. And here's, there is Kootenai's Wee Willie right there. That's right before Norm got him. He was in uh, Indiana and Michigan. You know, he came from Utah. Kootenai Kid, of course, was his son. And then Kootenai's Wee Willie was a fast POA. And it was always him and Stuart Stanny Boy were two of the fastest. Um, and they're both legends in, in the book and spots included. He died on Norm's Ranch, of course. Uh, Kootenai's Wee Willie. This is one of the Stevenson bred. Dragon Inns is his prefix but he named this one tippo dragon that was another thing he his two big things was racing and he promoted the dragon horses early on and he told me it took him 40 years to you know help the heads and the necks and the tails and stuff on the dragons but he crossed a lot of horses early on and until his death he, he raised poas we'll talk about after he died that were by a famous quarter horse. So he promoted quarter horses and apps into POAs and uh, that's where this horse gets a lot of his color too. And he had a nugget, I think he was a nugget gem son or something like that, maybe a grandson, but the famous Appaloosa Stallion nugget gem, but he was a few spot and he told me, you know, I got lazy. He said, I talked to Norm a lot on the phone for hours and hours when he was an older gentleman. And he said, yeah, in the eighties, I was really busy with my career and he said, I." had a full born in like 79 or so or 80 and he was a few spot and I just kept him for a long time he said and he was a few spot so he knew color genetics sitting down in Texas along before a lot of people talked about him but he just didn't he wasn't going around sales anymore or shows so people didn't realize he had so many POAs he also told me as a kid there was two things he wanted that he couldn't have he wanted a pony and he wanted a gun like a rifle and when he became successful in life, he ended up with over 100 ponies and horses at all, usually all times, 100 on his ranch and ranch places. And he had over 100 guns in his collection. So he fulfilled his childhood dreams and wishes there. There's Tippo Dragon. He raised a lot of babies by him. This is easy to see Leo. It's got a lot of his breeding in it. He wasn't the breeder, but he bought a package back from, he'd sold some mares and horses to a family in Texas. They made a big splash in POAs for a while. They were on the back cover all the time for a year or two. And then they sold out and they sold most of it back to, uh, to Norm. So that's, he ended up going to, this was his sale picture and you see Justin there commented easy to see Leo and I said yes and he said he was sitting with his grandparents when Ray purchased him and Ray Pete's bought easy to see Leo bred some uh, nice uh, some quick horses too he had Leo in him I believe Janelle uh, Janelle Burton now I believe one of the ponies she raised was an easy or er, raced in POAs gamed I should say was an easy to see Leo offspring so I'm trying to see the first POA we ever Dragon Inn's Shady Lady, 1984. Yep, Dragon Inn's Shady Lady, that makes sense. So I have some pictures of some Dragon Inn's here. Uh, Norm was a big uh, promoter of the sale. He consigned a lot of stuff to the national sale. It just helped him get it out there. Uh, this is one Dragon's Chiquita. Uh, of course, Mary Elizabeth Douglas, very famous. Uh, POA kids if you had a rank like a top hundred she'd probably be in there close and this is one of them she wrote rode this mare was very tall in the hip and uh, Ran downhill a little bit, but she was very modern for night the 80s She was born in the late 70s again a lot of horse breeding and Norm told me every horse in her pedigree and where he found it but when he bred it to this horse, and it just, you know, a lot of people would be bored by that, but I found it fascinating and really enjoyed the conversation. So I think this is Willie Moon. I know the Dempskis from uh, Bob and Linda and their daughter Cara, they ended up with one of these Willie horses in Wisconsin. Here's Dragonins Daney. Of course, a lot of Dragonins ended up in pedigrees all across the country. Dragonin's War Dragon was one he had for a long time. And then Dragonin's Reward was his ID son that he raised a lot of good ones by. 
There's Kootenai's Wee Willie. Of course, you have Rutledge's was another Texas big program. I included this in here because, like I said, he was a Dragon supporter. He had a horse named Frisian Farm, Son of Dragon. He got in a dispute with the person he bought him from, so he just dropped the name Frisian Farms, and he only called, advertised him as Son of Dragon. And I may have a picture of him in here, too. But there's another Dragon Inns. He had Star Acres, Firecracker for a while down there. Dragon Inns, Lulu. Loud colored. She ended up going to uh, James Black in Indiana, who bred some really good, you know, Stormy Riches and bred some good POAs. Tough Pants, Smoky Pants, that's who I'm talking about from James Black. Here's Son of Dragon, and this was. Like it says, the son of dragon. This is one of the early stallions that Norm started with. And then he just kept crossing more and more horse onto this. And then he figured out about the color producing abilities of stallions. And he, he threw that in there too. And here I put this book in here too. So if you guys have a chance, there's a cool picture there. If you guys have a chance to see... Uh, Jeremy and Julie Stevens uh, Facebook page their daughter owns one of the last POAs bred by Norm he's a cool stallion I mean he's a great looking horse and he's so much horse blood he's Spanish array on the bottom I think twice and then his sire is Fly the Red Eye who was one of the last supreme champions in the court horse breed meaning he had to be a race horse and then compete in the arena and win his halter points and uh, he wasn't very tall. I believe he did that in 2012. And uh, Norm bred four or five mares to him and then passed away. And the legacy he left of those babies, they're all over the country. There's some in Texas, Minnesota. That stud is in Kansas. And uh, he's going to make his mark if they want to. If they want to keep him a stallion and breed him, he's going to make his mark on POA. I fly first class is his name i believe yep jeremy and Jewel, jeremy just put that and he traces back to dragon so that ties it in full you know uh lynn puffenberger got the credit for breeding to uh to spanish array which he should have he's the one that made champions by him but norm stevenson also hauled mares up to oklahoma it was a little harder for him and he bred mares to Spanish Array, and he kept a lot of the fillies, and then he crossed them. And then TX's Chippin' Array was a few spot that uh, out of a Spanish Array POA salty mare, and uh, and of course Pal Chippin' Putt, and he ended up being with Norm for a while, and he did a lot of stuff, a lot of good stuff for him. And Norm came back. Uh, Pat Burton helped get him active again, and then of course Melissa. Slayton actually moved down there and helped condition some POAs for him and stuff. And uh, see, and he ended up winning the Futurity, Select Sire Futurity, years, you know, 40, 50 years after he'd been in POA. So that was kind of cool. And another thing about Norm, there's two people in this picture, in the main picture that we're talking about tonight, that are not in the Hall of Fame. And D Sales, you know, I could make a case to get him in the Hall of Fame. But, you know, it might be a little tough because, he, you know, their claim to fame kind of was they bought those two stallions, but they did do a lot in Washington. So there's pros and cons. I could write a good story to get him in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and then the only other gentleman in this picture not in the Hall of Fame is Norm Stevenson, and flat out, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I mean, it's just uh, it's a travesty that he's not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, just the fact that a man bred for hundreds of registered POAs, served on the board of directors, and then donated POAs, many POAs, to youth in Texas, to the Texas club to give away and to 4-H and different things and just kids that had come on his place. If he took a liking to them, he might just give them a pony. So anybody that does that, if you're just breeding some stuff that ain't that good and you're giving away ponies, that's one thing. But if you're were a past director and been doing genetic stuff for years and breeding champions and you're still giving away ponies that's hall of fame worthy to me so again go out and 
Check out Norm. I'm not trying to do too big of a plug for my friends up there in Kansas, but he is a cool stallion, and he's one of the last ones. Well, he is the last full crop from Norm Stevenson. So uh, NR, Norman Stevenson was his name. Some people called him Steve, and POAs are pretty sure most people called him Norm or NR, but in his real life, a lot of people called him Steve. He put himself back through college, and in 50, he became an attorney at the age of 50. He became a assistant DA for several counties in uh, Texas, including the county Dallas is in, and he was, and then he moved down to Granbury or wherever he was down there, and uh, I think he had a law firm for a while, but uh, he was an assistant DA for many years. So at a at an older age in his fifties. So, so that's our uh, perspective, or however you want to call it. There, a little bit of history. We're a little bit over an hour. You know, not every episode is going to be about one horse or one family or whatever. Uh, like we did the art of POA. I thought was a cool episode. Uh, Susie. Schultz and I did the one about POAs that rocked the 80s. You know, I just tried to do cool different episodes, and this one was meant uh, to be that with these seven gentlemen in this picture. And they all have their own stories. If they were here today, they could all, they would all tell us. So the last two to pass away in that picture were the two youngest, and that was uh, Lynn in 19, uh, or 2018, and then, of course, Norm right after him, I believe, in 2018. So, And they were just a year apart. So they were the, the last two living from that picture. But uh, wildly, you know, almost every one of these gentlemen lived into the 2000s, except for uh, Keith Stone, who passed away fairly young at 72. He passed away in 1994. Otherwise, uh, in 72, you know, still still older, but everybody else lived to be mostly into their 80s or 90s. Uh, James McNeil passed away at 78. So so I'm glad you guys liked the history. Shirley said, love this history lesson. Sometimes I just got to go off on a history tangent, so I got all this stuff floating around in my head. So some of the upcoming episodes, not quite sure with spring and summer coming here when the episodes will be, but we need to do a Ruth Picoy episode, just what she did with photography and POAs. We could just have an episode just on the photography. And thanks to Jan Rogers through Ruth's daughter, Karen, Jan was able to save a lot of stuff, and I ended up getting hundreds if not thousands of pictures from Ruth's estate that I wouldn't have without Jan's help. And I got some magazines and cool articles and stuff too. So we will be talking about that. We will have a 7Ms, kind of a teaser tonight, but a, a Moser family episode uh, coming up. We need to do a Lannan's episode. I've been going to do one for three years, but that's going to be a big episode too. And of course, they got out early on, you know, in the early 70s. So the history is kind of far between now. Uh, but anyway... Uh, thank you everybody for watching the show. I think it was a good show. We had a lot of participants and uh, they're waving at me. The cleaning crew is waving at me here through the door because I'm still here and everybody else is home watching uh, The Voice. So 359, there we go, 360 hearts. I like those hearts. Keep those hearts coming, guys. So, all right. Thanks again for watching. Enjoy the song. See you next time.